would like to thank Catherine for coming today to lead our connects. We have Catherine Mott. She's the founder of Blue Tree Capital Group, Blue Tree Allied Angels, and the Blue Tree Venture Fund located in Pittsburgh, PA. Ms. Mott is the past chairman of the Angel Capital Association and the Angel Resource Institute. She is a member of the ACA Public Policy Committee and also just completed a third term as one of the 21 individuals selected for the SEC Advisory Committee on Small and Emerging Companies. Prior to forming her own business, Catherine worked 17 years in corporate banking management, where she served in senior management roles for investment sales, wealth management, commercial lending, business development, and retail ex expansion. Today, Ms. Smott uses these experiences and her education to bring together capital and prime investment opportunities. Catherine holds an MBA in finance, a BS in education, and a master's degree in education. So Catherine, I'll let you get started. Happy to do so, and thank you for having me today. I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to walk everyone through um, kind of the landscape, what um, uh, Allison has called the nuts and bolts of angel investing. So bear with me here. I'm gonna, all right, here we go. Well, um, some of you heard me speak before and, um, and a lot of the information I get is from the Angel Capital Association and some of the other key uh, data aggregators in the United States. So I look forward to uh, speaking with all of you about the landscape and what it looks like and what it means, particularly for people raising capital um, from this asset class. So anyways, let me start with who are angel investors. Angel investors are typically entrepreneurs or have been entrepreneurs themselves, and um, they like to um, actively invest and contribute to the ecosystem. So they're really pretty, they tend to be, many of them tend to be very involved. Um, they're accredited investors by the SEC definition, which means they have a net worth of a million dollars or they earned 200,000 this year and the previous two years. Or last year, thanks to the SEC Advisory Council I work with, we extended uh, with the definition to those who are sophisticated. We define sophistication more um, adequately. And that is if you are like an investment professional, you certainly should be allowed to do this. Or if you're an attorney working with startups, you know, or you're a CPA. So that has been added to the accredited investor definition. Um, so um, accredited investors invest their own money. They don't have someone else managing it. It's not like a family office kind of thing. It's people who are interested in doing this themselves. And they like to invest in local companies, like to drive by and see cars in the parking lot and lights on. So, and they particularly don't want to invest in family businesses. So if you're a family business, um, you know, run by your family and it it's, it's meant to be a lifestyle company, that is not something that angels invest in. So at what point do they invest? Well, they typically invest after there's been an idea and there's been friends and family and, you know, the, the product has been designed um, and this is just very general. So, you know, it's, you know, when I, when we speak about this, but um, they, they like to be seed funders. And so um, angels, angel groups, so individual angels, angel groups, and many angel groups have started seed funds like we did at Blue Tree. And they like to invest at a point where, you know, the product has been designed, they're starting to test it with customers, they have customers, and they're working towards improving the product and, you know, and getting it to a point where it will need a series A round of investment, at which point, venture funds come in and you'll notice that angel groups and, and seed funds come into this startup funding expansion stage because they tend to follow on and invest and protect their companies. So this is just another way of looking at it. Don't, just ignore the company valuation below because that number, you know, changes according to, to market and markets. So um, but if this just gives people an, another, another way to look at what I just showed you. So one of the things I really like to do is explain to people when I when we're we have a chance to talk about and just angel investors is they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, they could be unsophisticated. They could be very sophisticated. Um, some like to be 
guardian angels, which mean they like to be active advisors and mentors, or there are those who are like, hey, good luck, just let me know how you're doing, and I'll be totally passive. There are super angels. Super angels are people who invest large dollar amounts and like to be an active investor. So um, I'm trying to think, um, I'm trying to think of a West Coast, uh, Ron, um, Ron Conway on the West Coast, that's how he invests his money. And then of course there are angel networks and funds and these are people who aggregate their money and their knowledge and they work together to perform due diligence and other things to really build a healthy portfolio. So they act more like a micro VC. And then finally, there are single family offices. That, that's a relatively new thing in the past, you know, I'd say five or six years, we're seeing more and more single family offices wanting to be angel investors. This is how it's grown. This is an older slide, but in, on, on the left you see 2019, this says over 600 and growing. This number is the 600 that we know of. We believe it's closer, the Angel Capital Association believes it's closer to 1,000 because there are a lot of clubs out there that just do this you know, on their own or they join and follow angel list or something like that and they'll be in and out, in and out, you know, and you know, so we're thinking it's closer to a thousand and, and quite frankly, we see, um, we see multiples in, in the Midwest and, in, and across the East Coast where we actively participate. So as you heard me say, why, why networks? Why are angel networks growing? It's because, you know, there's the power of aggregating your money and your knowledge and your experience to do collective due diligence and mitigate your risk. This whole idea is in order to be successful in this asset class, you know, professionals say you need to have a portfolio of at least 25 companies. It's the riskiest asset class, you will lose 50% or more of your companies. So the whole idea is how do we mitigate this? And the way we do that is the way we work together to get higher quality deal flow. We get strength in numbers. We're not just saying, hey, here's 25,000. Together we're saying, here's 350,000 or here's 500,000. Now we can sit across from the company and we can be more helpful. So who is funding these companies? So what is this? What's the number? The number is, this is 2017, I'm going to show you 2019. And the reason I'm going to do that is that there is, we see, we're seeing a shift. And I want to explain what the shift that we're seeing. So in 2017, there were 20, you know, the angel investors invested 27 billion in the U.S. Compared to 69 billion of venture capital. 71,000 deals, that makes sense, compared to 7,700. If you think about it, look at the stages they're investing in. They're investing in later stages compared to angels. Now, 2019 is going to look a little bit different. 2019 was roughly 24 billion compared to venture capital, 133 billion. Less deals, look what's happening here, but more deals venture capital. And here is what we're seeing, and it's not just us, but with our colleagues. Many of us started a, a small fund, a micro VC, and we acted that way. So where we once were categorized as an angel investor, as an individual angel or an angel club, we have moved over to the venture capital. And so now we get categorized as a venture capital firm, as a micro VC. So you can see that change that's happening. And I make that here as the market shift. Many angel groups have become micro VC funds. Angels are really important to the economy because all net new jobs since 1980 have come from companies five years old or less. If you just take, you just take those companies under five years old and take them out of the mix, you will have that red line. You will see net job creation absent startups. So angels are the most critical component along with the incubators and accelerators that are driving this to net new job creation in the United States. This is what we show policymakers all the time, and this is what gets their attention. The other thing that gets their attention is everybody thinks everything's happening on the coast. And that's true. About 
70% of VC is either in California, New York, or Boston. We, we totally get that. But the thing is, angels are active everywhere. And if you look at this, you look at where angels have planted a flag and are actively involved in every part of the United States. Blue Tree, we've been around since October 2003. Um, this is pretty much who we are. Our number is roughly, I think this year, I, I just, we just reported our numbers, but we've invested roughly $60 million, somewhere around there up to this point. We've been very blessed to be very, um, you know, recognized. Uh, CB Insights recognized us as one of the top 20 angel groups in the country. We've also been recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 50. And just recently we have bragging rights. We have, um, we, you know, we're our 10 year realized IRR, and I'll get into this a little later, is 18.8%. So we are a top tier fund now. So what's the foundation elements of a successful angel group? It's being able to be a process driven organization around the elements that will make your portfolio successful. So it's around sourcing and screening. It's around doing due diligence. It's around structuring the deal and making sure that everybody wins. It's about monitoring and supporting your company to our healthy exit. So we at Blue Tree, we believe this is, we believe that early stage companies need a lot of help. And what we try to do is tap our network and make good matches with people who can help the companies. If it's not a good match, we ask the entrepreneurs to tell us and we pull that person away. So we really, it, that this is the key thing at really making sure that how we develop our process around the success of the company. So we do this with committees. We have a deal flow committee that meets every Tuesday. Um, we have a screening committee that meets once a month. So anything, you know, that we talk about on Tuesday, three or four of them are going to make it to the screening meeting. From there, things get moved over. If they pass through the screening meeting in our scoring sheet, which our scoring sheet is, you know, we usually give it to people who come to our screening meeting as guests so they can see the things that we look at. But it, it revolves around management, market, model. And those are, there will be scoring factors around all of those things. And if they move on and get a pretty decent score, they'll go to the due diligence committee. And then there's a two, two level due diligence process. There's a, you know, should this move further? What, what do we need to look at as far as market and management? And you'll see why I say those two things, you know, and, and who they've surrounded themselves by. And then if that passes, then it goes into deeper due diligence. And that's, that's it when we do a full blown out professional, just like the, the VCs do, a deal memo. And that deal memo gets passed on to our investors. And, and we also, if we're leading the deal, we'll negotiate the terms. And we're not always leading, but when we are, we try to negotiate very favorable deals for our companies. Um, we also provide, like as I mentioned, monitors, people who can be board reps. And again, we try to make good matches. And it's really important. That match is not just, hey, what does this company need? They might need someone who has a good, strong financial background and needs someone CFO type. It might be, hey, this has to be someone who has the right chemistry. In other words, every one of us have had people we just can't work with, right? There are just certain personalities that drive you crazy. So we ask for people to really recognize that if chemistry isn't right, that is just as important as the value that they can add. And then we also have a growth and transaction committee, particularly when, you know, two things. When the company is at a point where it really needs help with advising how to scale or we have issues that we need to come in and help turn this company around. We have major issues. So one or two things, and we'll put a committee, we'll put our heads together. Now, sometimes we can't help, and we're just like there's nothing we can do. But where there is, we'll try to be helpful. So the things that angels look for here, as you can see, is we weren't looking for scalable companies. When we invest, it has to be a company that can show us that it can at least get to 30 million, and that's a minimum in revenue in five years. 
Most VCs look for 100 million. We're pretty satisfied with a company that can get to 30 million because at that point in time, they can become a good acquisition candidate and probably get a pretty decent multiple and make money for everybody. You need to see high gross margins, a large niche opportunity. There has to be an unfair competitive advantage and barriers to entry. And we like to see it's ready for customers. If it's just an idea on the table, if it's just bench top, you know, it's too early for us. Here's how we score companies. At the end of the day, I'm sure you've seen this in many of your CMU classes, is what caused companies to fail? And nine times out of 10, it wasn't the idea, it wasn't the, you know, the device itself or, or the patents or anything else. It, 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 it was around execution risk. And execution risk is the biggest risk we can take, and it's also the hardest one to assess. So we try to do our best job when we're evaluating whether or not we're going to invest. So we weighed it pretty heavily towards the management team and the market size opportunity. The product is, yeah, you know, great. And we can, and I can tell you, we have fallen in love with technology. Don't get me wrong, we've made this mistake multiple times. This is the greatest technology, but unfortunately the team couldn't pull it off. So, and then you can see the last thing is investment structure. So, you know, heavily weighted towards a balanced team. If you we understand that early stage teams won't have their full, you know, C suites or anything like that, but we expect to see them surrounded by people who can help them. And if you can show us that you listen and you listen, you know, to people who are, that have the experience and can help you, we are more inclined to invest in you. And we will help you fill out your team if, you, if and when you need it. So anytime we invest, the round in which we invest has to be somewhere between 15 and 30%. You know, the 30% is usually something we look for when we're investing in life science companies because they are capital intensive and we're in them for a long time and we're going to get diluted significantly. So we look for, the, for some kind of the round in this is pretty much to take 15 to 30% of the round. What do we invest in? Pure vanilla. This is National Venture Capital Association pure vanilla term sheet, preferred stock, liquidation preference, board seat, information rights, anti-dilution rights, participation rights to continue to follow on and support the company. So these are, it's, this is pretty standard. Um, and this also makes it easy for us to syndicate. So if we syndicate, we can invite our friends in Chicago that we syndicate with in Cleveland, in Lancaster, in Washington, D.C., our colleagues that co-invest with us, everybody can row, and everybody can row the same direction. So if everybody gets the same terms, we're all rowing in the same direction. We never invest in anything where people get carve-outs because now you have people, you have investors that are gonna behave in a dysfunctional fashion and everybody's not gonna be rowing in the same direction. So it can only be a headache for you as, as a startup. We like to see, you know, good founder market fit. That founder market fit is you have some experience in this industry. We like to see that. Um, there should be some vertical experience. And we like to know that you're a good leader and that you're gonna attract talent because attracting talent will help you build out your team, keep it balanced. In other words, you're gonna hire people that are strong where you are weak. And so we like to see that. Returns, as I said, this is a risky asset class. One or two out of every 10 investment brings most returns. Our 18.8% IRR that we received from 2010 to 2020 in our investments, it came from three or four companies. Um, the rest were you know, singles, a couple, you know, a few doubles, and the rest were losses. So, if the VCs get funding later, or if the company gets funding later from VCs, large VCs, we know we're gonna be diluted. Therefore, sometimes we'd like to see anywhere from a 10 to 30 X. So valuation is really, really critical. So angel returns, so where, where do they lie? They're, they really lie within the seed funds. As you, as you heard me say, we're, we're pretty 
excited about getting an 18.8%. But this is, you know, when you look at your alternative assets, um, this is kind of a, an average of all of those pulled together. Um, you know, this, you know, when you look at a 10 year time frame, um, this is what angels are looking for. The other thing is the impact of due diligence. A lot of times people will wonder why don't people like come in and pitch and write the check. Um, this is why right here is we can show that 26% of the deals um, that went into this study, and this is an old study, but it continues to hold true for us that received due diligence over 40 hours delivered an overall multiple of a 5.9x return. So this is why it's really important for angels to aggregate their money and aggregate their knowledge to mitigate their risks. So this game we play, <laughs> this investment strategy that we, we uh, try to deploy as angel investors, and I've been doing this, by the way, for 19 years, um, is that we have to answer this one simple question. And that is, is this team going to leverage these partners to execute this plan, engaging in these activities to defeat these competitors in order to better serve these customers selling this product or service with these current features and benefits which solve this problem at this price and capture this market which drives financial projections. You kind of get the idea here, right? So if you are about to raise money for um, a company, just look at these words that are bolded and underlined. These are the questions that your investors are gonna ask you about. So this is what, if you could just take this one slide and say, how do I build my slide deck? How do I build my company? Just use this one slide right here. So as I mentioned, um, I'm with Blue Tree Capital Group. Um, I started it to manage an angel group and we managed Blue Tree Allied Angels 19 years. We also started a venture fund about seven years ago. Um, so I also manage a small venture fund. So um, at this point in time, Allison, I'm really happy to take any questions anyone has. And if you wanna open it up and unmute or if you want people to chat um, and I'll keep my sharing my screen. Does that make sense in case somebody has questions about a slide? Does that make sense, Allison? Yeah, I think that makes sense. So um, to make it interactive, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute and um, interact with Catherine. I saw some heads shaking, so I'm hoping to see, uh, have some questions. <laughs> Does anybody? Sure. Yeah. If we've got if we've got time and I've got the floor, um, Catherine, I I'm working on a project where we're looking at uh, ethics consulting in startup spaces. And so, one place I'm really really curious about is in due diligence. Where are angels and investors seeing um, ethics as part of that process, and, and even um, evaluating, you know values driven managers and, C and CEOs and founders. So. Yeah, you know, I I'm glad you asked that question because um, as you know, a culture exists by design or by default, right? And so um, you wanna see it by design. Um, so we've run into issues. Um, um, and so things that I will say ethically um, that might be valuable is for instance, if you worked for another company and um, you develop some IP at that company. Um, we're gonna ask to see the contract that you have um, with that company. Um, we don't wanna find out later that you used IP, which they own, and then they come back and sue you later, right? And that's gonna impact how the company obviously can either continue performing, you know, growing, or how they're gonna have to share in the exit. So, Unfortunately, we have we we learned that the hard way one time when um, uh, someone didn't disclose it, and then the company they worked for came in, and we had to agree to a royalty agreement. So that made us not trust the CEO, right? In another situation, um, fortunately, we had someone on the seat of the board, and when um, the CEO was uh, spending investor money on his or hers. Um, well, I don't know if I say, I'm just gonna say his or her, but I should say his, it was him. Um, 
a brand new uh, lease on a Jaguar. You know, so, um, you know, ethics are important. Um, in another situation, um, you know, uh, we were, you know, who's doing the bookkeeping, help us understand, we need, you know, we're doing some due diligence. You should be upfront and tell us, my wife is doing the bookkeeping, and oh, by the way, one time I shifted money from here for my other little startup I have going over here from here to there, and it should have been, you know, it was investor money, and I shouldn't have done it, but I, I fessed up to it, I corrected, you know, you do not want us to find that out in due diligence. I mean, so there are tons of ethical issues, um, you know, that we have to deal with. Um, the more transparent someone is, and the more you create a culture of transparency, the less likely something like this will happen. And, um, and in one situation, you know, um, a CEO lost his job because of some things he did behind the scenes. And then we discovered, because we got a good CFO that came in and did some, um, some homework, so to speak, um, um, and found it and uncovered it and we had issues and unfortunately we had to fire that person. Just don't want to do that. So starting right up front, Jessica, is really, really critical. Making people aware of this is absolutely important. I hope I endorse what you're, what you're doing because I sure as heck like it. <laughs> And then Catherine, we have some questions in chat. Um, I have one from Martina. How, how does a company decide between angel investors versus VCs other than the financing minimum you mentioned? Let me end the show and do this. So at each stage that you raise capital, you have to think about what you have to prove to get that capital. So this next stage, you know, and keep in mind, these numbers are probably, they're probably different now because this is an old slide. But when you're first starting out your company and you're raising money, you're probably going to get some money from an incubator or from SBIR funding or friends and family. And that's going to help you build your product or build your thesis that what you're doing as far as a company is, is going to get to a point that it sounds feasible. And then you're going to work through that proof of concept. So you might get a pilot customer. Um, you know, in, um, in a medical one, you might get some early stage um, proof proof from some testing that you did from, you know, either um, in a Petri dish and, and, uh, and that's called um, in vitro, um, you know, and or, you know, through a small animal study, which becomes in vivo, you know, so things like that, that point, you're going to get your seed funding and some other maybe NIH funding with the government funding. And then it's time to like, you know, look, you know what, if we can really go to market here. And so we need to raise one and a half million dollars. And we've got the pilots, we even have a, you know, and we even have maybe a repeat customer. And we really believe that this is going to, you know, do well in the marketplace, but it's still high risk. So that's probably when you're going to go to angel networks. And then once you start scaling, because that's what, you know, the investors want to see, the VCs are going to want to see that repeat dynamics of revenue. Um, they're going to want to see that the IP is really solid and that you have a product roadmap, that the IP matches that ro product roadmap. You know, there's a lot of things that you're going to have to do in that meantime. So when you get that angel funding, you're going to have to do a lot of proof because they're going to want to see before they invest $5 million, they're going to want to know that this company can scale to $50 million, to $100 million, to $200 million. And so... That's at the point in each time you raise money, you're going to have to prove more and more. And you're building your company valuation while you're doing it. So at the bottom, you'll see how much more valuable your company becomes at each, at each point that you're raising capital. I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Catherine.
Um, we have another question in chat. Uh, how do you think an engineer could become a VC? What's a good path? I think the best path for an engineer, you know, in, is to get good business experience. One of the things that where we see companies fail is because they have, they're clueless about business. Um, so two things, um, work in a company, work for a startup company, learn business metrics, important, because let me tell you, key metrics, so your, your key performance indicators that you will be required to show your investor are gonna be really important, and you really have to understand that. You have to understand the assumptions behind the financials. So you really have to get some finesse there. So I would work in a startup company. You can also be an intern at a VC. The VCs, I will tell you, they like to see real world experience. So a lot of times what we see, like when we hire, we just hired some three interns and with those interns comes real business experience. And so they are, by the way, two are CMU, uh, CMU uh, can MBA candidates, and one is Pitt MBA. And all three of them have worked somewhere in another company. And what they bring to the mix is, you know, is their knowledge and expertise of having worked in a company. So it's really critical. You don't know how many times we see someone come and say, hey, I've read how to start a company in a book and think I can do it. And then when they realize, how much they've done it they really they burn through a ton of capital and then investors get really frustrated with them and they say we're done no more we're done so you can't get to that next level because you've made too many mistakes so i think it's really really wise to have a strategy about how you're going to get the real world business experience and then go work for a vc because vcs love it when you have real world experience because it's so this business is a lot of hands-on and it requires knowledge and it also requires what you can bring to the table do you do you have business development people do you know corporations that you can bring to the table those kind of you have to build those kind of relationships and show that you can add value to the vc thank you catherine and do we have any other questions Anyone else? I don't see any more in chat. <laughs> hey, um, yeah, so I remember uh, going back to where like how um, like VCs and uh, angel investors are kind of different in the sense that like VCs are sometimes uh, or they can be more specialized, different VCs and angel investment groups can be more specialized. Yes. Um, are there some, are, were there some instances where like uh, like a company approached you guys and like their business model just didn't really work with what you guys were interested in and like what would happen after that point if you took them on and you kind of realized something was wrong. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was. I could, I could talk about a lot of things that went wrong. <laughs> but, but here's one, you know, so, so the answer the first part of your question. Um, we, you know, where we don't have the experience and the knowledge and the connections to be valuable a lot of times it's hard for us to move forward with the decision. So um, there was a company that um, was an ag tech company out of um, Penn State. We loved the founder. I'm telling you, we love the founder. We love the way he built his team. And we were trying to come up with every reason. We were like, we should invest. And we really like this founder. Um, and, um, and he was surrounding himself with good people. He, and, um, and he had real world experience. So it, it was pretty hard for us to turn it away. Um, but we said, you know what, we're, we're not going to add any value. We could come into this, but we add no value. But we will introduce you to people we know invest in ag tech because we really like you. So, you know, that's an example. So that answers your first part. Uh, the second part is unfortunate is that there have been situations where we've been on the boards, like I said, where, you know, where we had an ethical issue and, and unfortunately someone had to be fired. Um, you know, and, you know, just think about the automobile and the lease, right? You know, you don't use investor money that way. Um, you know, um, you know, those situations, you have to let people go and then you have to find, now you have to do an executive search and you've got to find the right CEO, which is really different 
in startups because a lot of people, you know, I'd love to be the CEO if this thing is clicking along just fine and making 50 to 70 million and it can pay me a salary of a half a million a year and I'm willing to take the risk and come in. But when you're early stage, finding someone that says, okay, I'll step into this. Um, there's still a lot to prove. You know, they're really at a stage where, you know, they just have three or four or five, six customers and they still have a lot to prove. And we're not sure this thing can scale and we're continuing to try to build out the IP, but we're not sure how, what that strategy is, you know, and then you try to find that person. That is a lot harder to find. Now, uh, fortunately we found someone for our one company, um, you know, and, um, and not only did we, you know, did he, he want to take the risk, but um, uh, he brings a lot to the table um, with his business development connections. So we, we got lucky. But it's not always that easy. Um, th did that answer, Ian, your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yep, you bet. Great. Um, I have a question in chat. Uh, Ramesh says, I see the stage of raising funding, but do we have certain numbers of customers target for each stage? Yeah, you know, that's the problem with, you know, with, the, with this asset class is it's so gray. You know, you do private equity and it's so black and white. And the company's been around for 25 years. They've got past history. You can look at things. You can slice and dice it based on their past history. Um, here, what we're doing is we're evaluating a company and an opportunity. And it's really gray. Um, you know, you look, you're looking at a set of assumptions in the financials that are unproven. So think about that set of assumptions that are unproven. So it's pretty gray. And so we don't do black and white. Here's how many customers you need to have. Um, it has to fit into that whole scoring. And we have a page and we have four and a half pages in due diligence that we do. So there's a checklist that's four and a half pages long. Um, you know, we, we have it summarized. And, and Allison, I'll send our screening list that shows the scoring sheet, I'll send that over to you. You're welcome to share that. That might be more helpful because what really matters is how it fits into the whole picture of how we evaluate the company. So we never have a hard and fast rule. There's how many customers. Um, and don't be afraid to ask. I mean, because sometimes you'll come in and we'll look at it and we'll, we'll say, here's what you need to do. Do this and come back. Um, we did that with a company three times. So they'd do something, we'd say, do this, come back, do this, come back. The third time we, we ended up investing in them because they were like, hit it, nailed it every single time. And it's like, okay, all right, let's, let's run with this. So as a matter of fact, we got an exit from that company, a very nice exit. <laughs> all right, do we have any other questions today? Okay. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great. And, um,